Hello, so my name is Ralph Philip Weinmann, and I'll be giving a talk about um, baseband exploitation um, in 2013 and what has changed since I last gave talks about this subject. So who am I? I'm a security researcher from Germany. I was previously in academia at the University of Luxembourg. I've recently started my own company and have a keen interest in mobile, wireless and embedded systems. And I try to break them, find vulnerabilities in them. I was the first to practically demonstrate exploit vulnerabilities in baseband stacks three years ago, for instance, at the Congress at the 27th V3. And in these three years, uh, a lot of things have changed, and I'd like to look back on what has happened and what, what the changes are and what, how, how the landscape has, has become in 2013 and how it will develop in the next couple of years. So, first of all, who in this room has heard of the hexagon architecture before they came into this talk? Oh, wow, so a lot of people took this just by chance. Okay, interesting. Um, so, the hexagon architecture is a CPU architecture developed by Qualcomm, which is a mobile chip manufacturer um, for basebands. Um, previously, um, all basebands in the last couple of years have been running on, on ARM chips. Many, many years ago, there used to be um, DSPs in the old Nokia's. You had dedicated DSPs uh, where the basebands were running. So how many people in the room do actually know what a baseband is in a cellular phone? OK, OK, that's good, because then I don't have to start from scratch. OK. OK, so I will talk about the importance of the hexagon architecture for mobile exploitation this talk. I will give an introduction to this architecture. I will talk about past issues with a BLAST, which is the real-time operating system that Qualcomm is using on these chips now. I will talk about the difficulty or the non-difficulty of return-oriented programming and similar techniques on this architecture, show an example vulnerability, and draw some conclusions. So there's this company, Strategy, Strategy Analytics, which does um, basically market share surveys for various chips. And they publish expensive surveys for a couple of thousand dollars for which they give abstracts as well. And here you see um, a pie chart for the, the baseband manufacturers in 2013. And what you see is that um, in terms of shipment share, 63% of all shipped units were shipped by Qualcomm. Um, the next biggest manufacturer is Intel. Uh, sorry, no, MediaTek, sorry. <laughs> um, which is a Chinese manufacturer, um, which is very popular in China as well. You don't find many units with MediaTek uh, in Europe yet. Um, the, second, uh, the third largest then is Intel, and the rest um, is split among um, others that I'll go into uh, on one of the next slides. Now, however, um, most of you will have a smartphone. And many of these smartphones are LTE capable these days. Now, if you look at the market share distribution for LTE chipsets, it looks somewhat different. Now, this is the shipment share in the first quarter of 2013 for LTE uh, chipsets. And what you see here is basically uh, Qualcomm totally dominates this market. So 97% of all of the chipsets, uh, all the chips that were going into mobile phones um, that were LTE capable were Qualcomm's. Now, this obviously creates an interest to go after this target. But let's have a look at the other players first and what will maybe change in the next year or in the coming years. So Intel, which uh, bought Infineon Wireless, I think like two and a half, or th I think roughly about the same time I gave the first talk three years ago, they are now shipping the chips that they promised two years ago. So they have been promising these LTE-capable chipsets for a while, and they're now shipping them in the Galaxy Tab 3, for instance. But that's the only device I found that actually has this chip. MediaTek has announced LTE-capable basebands for 2014. Unclear what will happen there. NVIDIA 
um, bought iSera, which is a soft modem, uh, sorry, a soft modem manufacturer that was, uh, I think, originally from the UK, also a couple of years ago. And they now have an LTE-capable modem chipset as well. Uh, this is a standalone chipset, so it's not integrated with the actual application processor. So in, you have different designs. In some of the devices, you have the application processor and the baseband CPU in the same package, and in the others, um, you have them in two separate packages. Now, they have pro prototypes of these LTE-capable modem chipsets that they've uh, shown at various events. And they've also announced um, a Tegra 4i, which has an integrated modem um, chipset that is um, announced for early 2014. So you'll probably find it in your device by mid-2015, I guess. Then there is Spectrum, which is actually, uh, from a European perspective, that this is a niche thing. Um, but from the Chinese perspective, this is a huge player. Um, but they only do um, time division LTE chipsets, and uh, they don't support um, 3G. Um, they ship this SC9610 already. I haven't ever looked at these things, but from what I've heard and what I've seen, Spectrum is a, is a big player in, on the Chinese market. Then you have Broadcom, and this is an interesting story. So, about two and a half months ago, Broadcom announced that they had bought Renesis, um, well, Renesis Basebands um, division. And this is interesting because that is the former Nokia baseband team. And they basically, um, Renesis has a chip that is ready. Um, it's a um, big little um, arm, so it's a Cortex A15 and, a, a, well, four, four Cortex A15 and four Cortex A7s in one package together with a modem. And according to, this, uh, to the specs I've read about this um, chip, it supports LTE on almost all bands and is, ca is capable um, of up to 150 megabits per second. So if this actually is something that they're producing already, then this is a real threat um, to the market share distribution that you've seen before. For Ericsson, it's unclear because um, like half a year ago still, there was ST Ericsson, which was um, the semiconductor manufacturer ST in a joint venture with Ericsson, and this broke up. And now there's just the Thor devices that um, Ericsson will continue, which are the standalone chipsets, but it's unclear what will happen to the Nova Thor, the integrated chipsets. Okay, but now let's look at Hexagon again. So Hexagon originated from um, Qualcomm's general purpose um, digital signal pro processors that they did many, many years ago. I think like almost two decades ago, they started for the lower, like for the actual, for demodulating the actual physical layer, you have to have a, a digital signal, proce a digital signal, uh, signal processor in your cell phone. And this is where the Hexagon originated from. And it was also used for audio processing. Um, Hexagon is a, an architecture that has very large instruction words, and it can do about one to four instructions per cycle. So it's a very interesting parallelism there. It is a barrel processor, which is, if you are programming it, you have to get used to this a little bit. What this means it, is that um, you basically every um, process uh, sees a separate um, um, set of uh, registers, and you, you have like basically three um, things in this barrel, and it shifts around. So you actually have like three hardware threads that are, um, need to be filled by the, um, by the software um, scheduler. And what this means is if you run single, if you run a task single threaded, it only runs at a fraction of the actual clock speed, namely um, how many of these um, things you have in the barrel. So usually, for the hexagon, you have three of these slices in the barrel, and it shifts between these three. You have a unified address space for coding data that is byte addressable. However, there are alignment rules. Usually, things should be aligned by uh, four byte, um, um, by, 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 by four byte alignments. There are situations where you need eight byte alignments. You have 32 general registers that are 
32-bit, but they can also be used in register pairs that are then 64-bit uh, wide. An interesting feature is that uh, the um, architecture supports so-called hardware loops that are nestable. What this means is basically um, that you initialize a um, loop counter once, and uh, you then have a loop body that you run, but you don't need to spend any cycles on actual comparisons in this loop. So this is done by the hardware, and this can be nested several, um, um, several steps deep. There are many, many addressing modes on this thing. So for instance, it has something like a circular addressing um, in reverse or with a scatter factor or something. And um, I think the, the, the list of different addressing modes um, in the hexagon manual is about one page already in the, in the latest revision. The design goals for um, this architecture were actually for the chip to be low power. This is something, the constraints here are truly orthogonal to, to security. So the idea was that if you use this very long instruction word architecture instead of out of order execution, um, you gain a lower footage and a lower power consumption. So what you basically do is you don't increase the clock rate on these chips, but you increase the work that is done per tick. They also try to avoid all kind of speculation, like branch speculation or predictive um, data fetches. And they also try to avoid memory stalls um, as, as hard as possible. There are three different uh, um, levels of parallelism um, in the uh, CPU. You have an instruction level parallelism, you have a data level parallelism, so it's like some things like SIMD, and you have the thread level parallelism, which is um, uh, this, this barrel thing. There is another interesting feature, um, which is um, the fact that the uh, atomic unit um, of execution on this uh, CPU is not a single instruction, but a so-called instruction packet. And an instruction packet basically groups together different instructions that will be executed in parallel by the CPU. There are four parallel pipelines um, which are called slots for some reason. And different instruction types are assigned to these different slots. And of course, constraints for this grouping supply that you can read in the documentation. It's, I can't give you all the constraints on in this um, presentation. Of course, these constraints um, simply um, have the effect that the hardware resources are not oversubscribed. If you read the manuals, they will tell you that you cannot branch into the middle of a packet. It's not quite clear whether branching in their terminology means that you also can't, should not be able to return into a packet. Empirically, however, you can. At least most of the time, um, I've had some issues with that, which I, however, think might have to do with uh, caches. So it might be that there's an instruction level cache um, which has a, a packet fetched already, and then it fails if I go into the middle of it. However, I've had success with this if there was uh, a certain distance uh, between the, um, the packet I branched into and the uh, location that I, sorry, that I returned into and the uh, location that I returned from. Okay, let's have a look at the chipset evolution. So, there's the QDSP6 version one. So the uh, QDSP6 is the internal name for um, the hexagon. I guess it's like the sixth iteration of the DSP that they produced. And the version one, I actually I only found one handset that supposedly has this chipset, which is the Pantesh Razer Vega. I'm not sure has anybody in this room ever heard of this device. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's for the US market, but even when you talk to people from the US, nobody knows this one. The QDSP 6 version 2 was in a lot of devices, namely all of them that had the QSD 8650 or the MSM 8200 um, and these other chipsets. The QDSP version 3, um, however, um, seems to have mostly been in uh, CDMA devices. Um, one of the devices that is not a CDMA device 
that I was able to find was the Sony Xperia Acro uh, HD IS-12S. So this is a model that's specific for the, for the Asian market. The version 4, again, is the one that is very widespread at the moment and that the rest of the talk will be about. So version 3 and below basically is historic. It's not because that, those were from the times when um, the, the baseband, the actual cellular baseband stack, was still running um, on an ARM CPU. And the QDSP architecture merely was for the audio processing and the demodulation task. So the MSM8960, for instance, is in the Samsung Galaxy S4, in the Apple iPhone 5 and the 5S. And um, no, actually, in the uh, for iPhone 5, there's the MDM9615, sorry. And the 5S, there's the 9615M. Um, and the BlackBerry Z10, you again have the MSM8960. And there's a lot of other devices that have the same uh, chipset. I'm not going to list all of them. And the very latest iteration um, is the MSM8974, which is, for instance, in the LG G2 and the Sony Xperia Z Ultra and also in the Nexus 5. Um, internally, these also have the Snapdragon names. So um, QDSP5, for instance, that's Snapdragon 800. Um, Snapdragon 600 is QDSP4. OK, but I, I prefer the actual uh, chips names instead of the, the Snapdragon names. So let's see what kind of documentation and tool chains you have. So um, hex, the Hexagon Programmer's Guide now is available for version 2, 4, and 5. For some reason, it's not available for version 3. But that wasn't widely used anyway. Um, when I last gave this talk um, one and a half month ago, I wasn't aware that they had released the version 4 and version 5 reference manuals. They did that in, I think, beginning of October. But you really have to search for it, and it's, I haven't seen it announced anywhere. Um, but I'll give you the references at the end, then you can find it. Um, initially, I tried to build my own tools from scratch. Which is, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the ISA is, is complex. It's from, from, in terms of complexity, it's about um, as complex as x86 with all of the extensions that you have at the moment, I would say, but with less documentation. And obviously, testing is a lot harder than on x86. So, I mean, for instance, like, I guess like, a lot of people in this room have written an ARM disassembler. That's easy. You can do that like, for, if you don't, want to do all of the Neon stuff, you can do that in a weekend. You will not be able to do that for, for Hexagon. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We'll try, we will most probably spend like a month or two. And then you will still not have the full, full functionality. And then I will wish you very good luck with testing that. So it, is, um, it seems to be much easier to start from a publicly released toolchain. And Qualcomm indeed does release um, a toolchain. Based on the, uh, on, on they, they release patches to the GNU toolchain, so you have uh, GNU bin utils with the GCC. And recently, they've also st uh, started sub, um, um, posting patches to Hexagon. However, the, uh, sorry, not to Hexagon, to LVM, so they're Hexagon patches to LVM, and they are in the tree now. Um, however, the Hexagon um, supporting LVM looks very rough at the moment. For instance, the MC framework that you would need for disassembly, for disassembling, is not there at all. And the output that I get from uh, the, the assembler and the compiler, it looks OK, but um, the maturity of the GNU toolchain seems to be um, much more advanced than the LVM. The LVM thing seems to be an experiment, but I think that's where, where they will move eventually. Now, if you look at the differences between the, dif uh, between the different revisions and you want to see like, how, how has this moved along, then you will see that there's unfortunately no reference manual for the version 3 available. So um, you have no change logs, so you have to diff the opcode headers in the hexagon GNU tools. What you will then find is they've added this very useful instruction pause, which allows you to pause to, for up to uh, 263 cycles. 
And they've added a vector um, instruction, which is a vector reduced complex multiply by scalar instruction. This is something that you need if you do DSP programming. This is the thing that you find documented. Interestingly, they only document the user level stuff because you then find all of these other differences, TLB lock, TLB unlock. Well, that's kind of obvious. Um, then you have RTE unlock, which is potentially related to runtime exceptions. But I don't know what K0 means and what K0 lock does. I guess it's a privilege instruction, but I don't know. It's not clear from the documentation that they have. Similarly for the um, L2 clean invalidate index. I guess that's like for cache invalidation and cleaning. Same for iMask. I have no clue what it does, said iMask. Um, so what you get is documentation for running your own user level code on the hexagon. And I think that's the, the goal that um, Qualcomm actually has. So they want you to write um, DSP application. So sorry, um, they want you to write code to make use of the DSP on the architecture. In version three, version four, it's a similar thing. If you look, they they, they actually have a, um, a change log. What they what has um, what has happened, and they tell you, we've added virtualiz support for virtualization. Where I don't see it anywhere. Uh, not even like in the not not even in the in the uh, in the uh, hexagon opcode files, I don't see. I don't see which which instructions are responsible for virtualization. They have added support for um, software-defined radio, so they have added two instructions, um, which basically make um, the uh, the so-called rake spreading in WCDMA demodulation uh, well, uh, basically a two or three instruction thing. But some of them they have already added in version three, if you look at the differences. And they, have also, they also tell you that they have debug and trace enhanced. But again, um, I don't know. Like, there's no further documentation about this. And also, they allegedly have a larger address space, which I can verify as well. I don't, I don't see this in the, in the opcode files that are generated. Then if you look at the QDSP5 and up, so this is the Snapdragon 800. They've now introduced floating point support. Um, this is interesting. I guess this is related to the fact that uh, the Snapdragon 800 is the first device that has um, these audio, audio capabilities that first came out with the Moto X, where you have um, voice activation. So you can say, OK, phone, do something for me. I guess that's what they needed the floating point support for, but that's the first one that I was interested in. And they also have something that they call enhanced data cache prefetch. Um, I don't, sorry, I don't know what that is. I haven't been able to find further documentation about this. There's also this version 5.5, um, which um, I don't know actually which chip that went into. And this adds a cycle count register, useful if you want to benchmark things. And it has this vector add and select maximum half words instruction, which, yeah, it's a synth instruction, useful for something, I don't know. But I mean, if you look at their um, manuals, you will see that they've actually tuned the CPU to do things. They have actually added instructions to make, for instance, things like H.264 uh, decompression faster. So they, they have very specific applications in areas for which they add these instructions. But you cannot, if you don't, haven't seen these application scenarios, you can't necessarily tell what they have added them for unless they tell you. OK, but let's look at the very basic things. Let's look at the, the useful instructions that we all can, can understand. Because I mean, the fact is, if you look for vulnerabilities, um, I, you run across a loop that does some simped stuff. Most of the time, you will not care because it's, it's in the lower layers. So I, I mean, at least for me, that was a very uh, quick test. If, there are exceptions to this. For instance, if you have something like a vSplat, which is this, um, a splat instruction, which puts the same byte into all the words, that's a vector instruction that is actually not for, for sim, that can be used, for instance, in memset. But look at the manual, and you will get 
an idea which of the instructions you will mostly see in DSP scenarios. And then you can see, OK, well, if you ever see this in a function, you will probably not have to analyze it further because it's just for the lower layers. And it's not actually something that would be, allow you to trigger a memory corruption easily. I'm not saying it's impossible. There have been cases <laughs> where you have been able, but it's just like it's a, it's a metric for me to judge uh, how, how, how hard I will look at a function. So if I can see it's from uh, the, the lower signal processing layers, I'm less likely to look at it. OK, so the useful instructions, obviously, are transfer instructions, which allow you to transfer between registers or allow you to put a, an immediate into a register. Um, you have ALU instructions, for instance, add, subtract, uh, multiply, and so on. And for this, you have like a 16-byte uh, sign immediate, immediate for the arithmetic that you can use and a 10-bit for the logical if you do an X or an AND or something. You have combined instructions that allow you to um, combine um, immediates into uh, basically a register pair. And you have MUX instructions that allow you to um, basically multiplex um, with the predicate. So depending on the predicate, you put one or the other into the instruction. You have a very really large chunk of knob instructions, 2 to the 24 knob instructions for you, basically any instruction that starts <coughs> with the 7F. <coughs> Sorry, I should have mentioned that. The uh, uh, CPU architecture is little endian. So uh, any instructions that start with a 7F, the rest of that doesn't matter. It's a knob. OK, now, um, a while ago, um, I'm not going to tell you exactly when to make searching a little bit harder, an archive of chipset documentation for the MSM8960 uh, mysteriously appeared on the x developer side. And um, interestingly, this not only contained um, chipset documentation, but for some reason, uh, they, uh, whoever posted it um, also put seven AMS security boltons in, into that archive. So AMS is, is the um, Advanced Mobile Subscriber System, which is the um, Qualcomm codename for their baseband stack. And these basically are very detailed descriptions of the bugs that they have fixed um, in their tree that they give to the vendors. And this obviously means that all of these bugs must now be considered public. Um, but you'll also find um, interesting things, like uh, the leaked docs, for instance, claim that um, in uh, benchmarks, they found that Hexagon, uh, for their baseband stack, spends up to uh, three times fewer cycle than an ARM9 on the control code in the baseband. So the control code, this means like, all of, the st all of the things that are not the, uh, the actual demodulation. OK. Um, now I'm skipping around a little bit. Um, I, I, I wasn't quite finished with the architecture, obviously. I just wanted to put the thing about the leaked docs in there. Um, we'll come back to that in a bit. But first of all, you have to also see um, what kind of different uh, control registers you have. Um, on the CPUs. So you have the loop registers, which are for the hardware loops. You have a program counter, obviously. You have a user status register. You have a modifier registers, which are for the circular addressing modes. You have predicate registers, which are for things like comparisons, so they store a result of a comparison. You have a user general pointer, which is for things like threat local storage. And you have a global pointer that can be used for global data. Now, before we come to actual vulnerabilities and looking at them, we have to understand the calling conventions a little bit. So there are caller-saved and callee-saved uh, registers in the ABI. That's nice. The ABI document is public now. It wasn't when I last gave it. Uh, I, I did not know that it was public the last time I gave this talk. Um, register generally, so, uh, registers R0 to R5 are generally used for passing the parameters. The parameters can be modified by the call key. So the caller must not depend on these being unmodified upon return. R6 to R15 are scratch registers, which need to be uh, caller saved. R14 and R15 are 
Um, oftentimes, or are in the, in the ABI, they're supposedly used. For, uh, they're supposed to be used for um, of the procedure linkage table. R16 to R27 uh, are again scratch registers, but these must be Cauley safe, not Cauley safe. R28 also is a scratch register, Cauley safe, and then you have R29 to R31, which also have uh, symbolic names, namely uh, the link register, the um, the frame pointer and a stack pointer, and these are um, Cauley saved, and they are used by alloc frame and dealloc frame, which are these are the things that are used for setting up um, and unwinding the stack. And then you have the processor state. Now, if you want to pass uh, things to a function, um, you fill left to right are just registers R0 to R, R5. Um, if it's um, a parameter that is larger than 32 bits, you can use register pairs if it's up to 64 bits. However, the pair must always be even odd. So if you have, for instance, you are at register um, R3, you have to skip this if you have a 64-bit uh, quantity. So you go to R4 and R5. And the rest goes on to the stack. OK. Um, you also have the, these two um, um, functions, alloc frame and dealloc frame, which basically um, manage the register bin, uh, the, 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 the register, um, yeah, the re well, the, the local data window basically on the stack. So what these do is they push the link register and the frame pointer onto the stack and they subtract a size quantity. So you give alloc frame a size quantity from the stack pointer and then they assign um, the, f uh, the frame pointer with the address of the old frame pointer that was on the stack. And the dialog frame is the inverse of this procedure that you use uh, upon return. There's also now a dialog return, which is not on this slide, um, which is basically a dialog frame followed by a jump to the link register so you can go out of the, um, out of the, the instruction frame back to the previous function. OK, so let's have a look at very simple snippets. Actually, um, in terms of time, I might skip this because we're looking at something a little bit more complex later. Um, so there's also the question of the security of the chip fabric. So the last time I spoke about Qualcomm CPUs at um, a Chaos Congress. What was the case was that you had the baseband CPU that was the master of the system on a chip. So this basically overruled all the other components on this chip. So this was a very scary thing because it meant that if you had a successful baseband attack, you could basically exploit um, and you could basically persist on the whole chip. In the current generation, um, of these systems on a chip, it's a much, much more complex uh, story because the current generation is, uh, <laughs> contains a lot of ARM cores. They actually have a dedicated ARM core in ARM7 for the bring up um, of the CPUs. This is the um, our so called RPM uh, chip. And the modem firmware now is loaded by the higher layer operating system, for instance, Android or iOS, and not the other way around. There is, if you look at some of these leaked documentations, you will see that they paint little yellow boxes that they call hardware firewalls. There is no further documentation about this. I don't, I don't know what exactly they do. I'm just a little bit skeptical, because as far as I know, this has been untested externally. So at the moment, it's not clear whether on these new chipsets, um, baseband to application processor escalation is possible. For instance, I don't know um, whether you can do funny things with DMA. So for instance, you can, if you have access to I.O. registers of another core, whether you can trigger a transfer to happen, for instance, into the application processors. Uh, memory. This is something that needs further research. I will also tell you how to do this research later. 
OK, but more changes. Um, the old chips used, the, the very, very old chips used a proprietary operating system called Rex. Later, this real-time executive was propped onto something called OKL4, which is a commercial microkernel based on L4. And in the hexagon baseband firmware, they've now abandoned this OKL4, and they have their own um, real-time operating system, which is called BLAST. Sometimes it's also called QRT. And this apparently was redesigned from scratch. Um, you will see some of the remnants from Rex uh, for compatibility reasons. And funnily enough, uh, you will also find an ARM 11 core um, that runs OKL4 still, but it, it, it's not running the actual baseband. It's just another core on the SOC for some reason. Security mitigations. Um, when I looked at this three years ago, there were no security mitigations. Now it's a lot better. So they have stack, well, maybe, depends on the vendor. They have stack cookies that are generated uh, by the built tool chain. These are on by default. And they also have a non-executable stack and heap. And they also have kernel and user mode separation in Blast. Except for the fact that in 2012, they had an advisor about this, where it became, so this in retrospect became clear to me that they only enabled this with the release in May 2012. So this is when they enabled DEP, and this is when they enabled the separation between the user and the kernel mode. And the interesting thing about this is that they state that the customer must verify that the performance impact of these changes is acceptable. So what this means is not every vendor necessarily has these things enabled. Um, for the major vendors, however, I found them to be enabled. So for instance, I've looked at a, an S4, and for, for, for the S4 firmware I looked at, um, all these things were enabled. And I guess a similar story for for all uh, the big vendors, hopefully. Um, they have safe unlinking for the heap. Uh, there are tricks that you can do to get around this, obviously, but it's become harder to do heap exploitation. And at the moment, there is no ASLR, which is nice for attackers, obviously. But also, ASLR on embedded devices generally is hard. OK, so let's wrap and roll. Um, so initially, um, I and other people as well thought that um, exploitation on this architecture with DEP enabled would become tricky because of um, the, the way that alloc frame and the alloc frame work and because of the fact that you have to find, um, you have to then find epilogues of function that do things for you. And uh, oftentimes this is prevented. Uh, Things, uh, useful things are prevented by dialog frames. But then you note that this dialog frame um, sets the, uh, the FP. And this is a very similar be behavior to if you had something that would pop the stack pointer off the stack on other architectures. This is a very similar thing. And as long as the instructions packets are not in the cache, they can be split. Now, um, we didn't talk about this because I skipped over the code examples. There are so-called compound instructions. So this means that it's actually one four-byte word that does two instructions in parallel. These are very annoying for return-oriented programming because you do, all, you do these two things together. They are also sometimes in documentation called duplex. Um, it's not clear. They use both. Um, however, you can deal with these um, if they just create constraint, constraints for gadgets. So mostly what this boils down to is that you need automation. You will not be able to easily do ROP um, by hand anymore. Um, what we did in 2010 um, was um, um, Tim Kornow, um, Halber, Flake, and I, uh, we wrote a paper about this problem, how to use um, SMT solvers to handle constraints to build ROP payloads. And uh, there's a, a Black Hat 2010 talk and a wood paper on this subject. And basically, the same things apply with some variations for this. 
There still is some way to go because um, back then we used uh, RHEL, which is the reverse engineering intermediate language, um, for this tool chain. And well, there is no RHEL translator for Hexagon at the moment. But um, if you are um, if you are comfortable with um, not having complete coverage, what you just do is you write something that translates all the basic instructions into um, SMT lib syntax for you, and you ignore all the rest. And you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I will not care about these in terms of gadgets. And then you can automate this. You can also do manual gadget switch, um, but this is very labor intensive. I've, I've done that um, two weeks ago, and it, it was not fun. Um, but if you do that manually, you will also see that um, what, to build a payload, what you will do is you will alternate gadgets ending in jump 31, which is the, uh, uh, or, or 31, which is the link register and, and um, the alloc frame. So you will build a ROP chain that alternates between these two. OK, but now you probably are, want to know how, how do you do this yourself. And the problem is that most smartphones have modem signatures that are checked at boot time. Um, so for USB modems, this is different. So most of the USB modems that you find have freely modifiable firmware. There may be exceptions. I haven't seen them yet. Um, also, there are Samsung Galaxy S4s um, where there's no signature check in the modem firmware. Um, it's not clear exactly, um, because uh, I have one of these handsets, and um, I've talked to other people, and they haven't been able to verify this. This depends on the fuse configuration in um, the chip that you cannot actually read out without, um, well, I, I understand nobody but Qualcomm can read it out. Well, not even if you have kernel level access, you can read this out because of uh, trust level shenanigans, uh, trust on shenanigans. Um, I have one of these phones. I, I can um, build a, um, a, um, a tool to test if people are interested. So then many other people can run this on their S4 if they have it rooted and they can test whether or not um, they can modify their, their modem firmware. According to the leaked docs, the uh, modem uh, bring up and signature check is done by a crate core. And the way I understand it, this is done in, trust, in a trust zone compartment. So it's not clear, but um, a bootloader hacks may, may help you get around this problem. Um, I've been talking to someone who had some ideas about that. Um, in terms of tools for analysis, there's the QDSP 6 version 5 toolchain now, which is released by the Qualcomm Innovation Center, which is um, based on GCC 4.4, and I forgot which version of Binutils it was. This can be used to compile C and C++ code and for Hexagon and inspect it using object dump. It doesn't build cleanly. You have to remove some stuff. I had to remove GDB from the Binutils and have to tweak, uh, had to tweak the, um, uh, the GCC compile process a little bit, um, but you can get it working. For the modem firmware that you get um, in firmware um, archives, you have an empty ELF section header, so you cannot just disassemble that with object dump. You have to first populate that manually or write a tool for that. There's also um, a hexagon plugin um, for IDA Pro that was written by the gentleman here in the front row and was released by GSMK. This is also based on uh, uh, bin utils. It's uh, for the version 4 at the moment. Um, I have, um, last week I've done some, some, some things so that it runs with version 5. I will contribute that back as a push to your master. And it, it still crashes on some firmware, uh, for instance, on the iPhone 5 firmware. I, have, I haven't quite figured out what the problem there is. But um, it, 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 it works. It works for analysis, as you will see. So as an example, we will look at one of the leaked bugs that is a classic stack overflow patched in May 2012 on the LTE Air interface. I picked this particular bug, even though some people might find it, find it uninteresting, because it's not easily exploitable. Um, but not many people have an LTE capability to send these messages. And also, the uh, stack protector um, prevents you from using that, unless you also have um, 
a, a, memory, um, a memory disclosure, which there also are many of in the, um, if you look at the leaked documents, but I'll just talk about this part. And the interesting thing is, this just again takes one message, a test loopback message, which is larger than 100 bytes. And um, it, I found it very surprising to see such straightforward bugs. And the only explanation I have was that at the time, the LTE stack was still very young. Um, and when I tried to, um, to verify this, this is what this assembly for this particular function uh, looks like. I have, um, I have not posted, I first wanted to post a screenshot of the actual bug, but I'll, I'll just, um, I'll just post this, uh, show you this assembly here. So what you will see, so this is actual hexagon code. So the first thing is the, um, the alloc frame, which basically sets up the stack. Then you will have uh, a call to a function which saves these callee um, registers um, R16 to R19. Then you have um, R3, which is set to the stack canary. Then you have a little bit of shuffling around of registers to save them for later. Then you have a call to a memset trampoline. So this is interesting. So most of the calls to these functions, to the often used functions, are actually trampoline. So they go to a function where you have an immediate extent and then um, a direct uh, jump to that function. So it probably would be useful to coalesce these into one function by, um, or have an option to coalesce these so that it's, it's more condensed. Um, then, um, in the same instruction packet, you also have uh, a write to the stack uh, for the stack canary, and you set the um, uh, one to zero. And the way it works is that basically the call is done last. So this is one instruction packet, but basically the register is set first and the memory is written first, and only then the call is done. After that, there is some initialization for this message router. Again, this is a trampoline function. And then you will see this P0, which is a predicate which basically comes from the comparison of this register R17. And this register R17, if you look up here, it is the register that is, it comes from R1. So it's identical to R1. So this was the length that was passed in. And here, this basically checked whether the TLB message length is greater than 100. If it's greater than 100, it basically errors out. Um, and at the end, what it does, it, so um, error, erroring out basically means that a lock message is written, and it goes to the, to, the, um, to the end of the function, which basically is this check canary thing. And the check canary just fetches the canary again from the, check, uh, from the stack and com uh, compares this to this, to this global value. And if it's, if it's equal, then it's good. If it's not, then the stack has been smashed, and it's an error condition. So, this is um, the latest version of the um, baseband that you will get if you have OTA auto updates for a Galaxy S4 that are analyzed here. So this is fixed there. Um, but I, I mean, also the, bubble, the, the bug has been um, uh, pub made public in 2000, well, not made public, but the, the advisory has been given in 2012. So it's, of course, it should be fixed now. Um, there are also other baseband versions and other phones where this is not fixed, but I'm not telling you um, which one these are now. It's just um, I wanted to give you an exa a positive example for this talk. Um, if you want to analyze more complex bugs, um, what you realize, I mean, this, this bug was shallow. It was in one function, and it was uh, this one parameter that came in and a mem copy. So this is. Uh, simple. For more, more complex bugs, um, you will often need to trace messages across the tasks. Um, this already became obvious when I did research for um, a talk at Black Hat 2011, where I looked at um, a protocol called SUPL that is sometimes um, also processed in the baseband. Um, if you don't have source code, you don't know where and how these messages are routed. However, if you have a malleable baseband, you can perform dynamic analysis. And um, the idea that I use here is basically I hook into the message router, which is, which is this called message or send routine. And 
uh, then I can trace where the messages are going in. This um, message router has, uh, uses UIDs for the different things, and there's a UID structure which is not publicly um, disclosed at the moment. It also seems to be different between different um, 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 OEMs, so it seems to be auto-generated. But I have a table that I have extracted for the S4 that I will also um, put um, on my block. It doesn't, doesn't fit here. Um, I should finish soon, so I will close with two things, namely the way forward. I will talk about the way forward for the offense side and the way forward for the defense side. So takeaway lessons here are the new architecture that we have uh, on the Qualcomm chipsets has raised the bar of entry significantly. Um, a lot of people can reverse and work with ARM code. There are decompilers for ARM. Uh, this is not the case for Hexagon. And I, I, ha I haven't met many people who've done analysis of Hexagon code. However, Qualcomm dominates this market at the moment, and attackers will have an interest, and they do have an interest in their chips. So they will adapt and learn, well-funded adversaries at least. Um, moreover, public leaks of vulnerability information obviously makes the attacker's task much uh, easier because they can use those uh, for testing, whether they basically they have ne they don't have to find a vulnerability anymore, they can just use the public vulnerabilities, either for training, or maybe they're all, uh, they're still unfixed in the targets they're attacking. A takedown is possible. And in fact, like um, this archive has been taken down a couple of days after it has been posted, but it has reappeared in different locations. Uh, the internet doesn't forget. So uh, you, uh, after these things leak, you can't get them back. I mean, we've seen this with other things as well. But this means that you don't have to find uh, the bugs. You just have to find the bug descriptions. And sometimes OEMs have slow patch cycles. Um, I hear that there are even new phones shipped that still have the bugs from the talk I gave in 2010. So this is how slow some of the patch cycles are. They're not um, high-end smartphones, but more the medium to low end. For ROP exploitation, um, forget about it if you don't automate, but it's not as difficult as you would first expect. For the defensive side, I think that killing bugs and hardening is only one strategy. Because after three years, we still see the same silly memory corruption problems. I mean, you could say, okay, after 40 years, we still see memory corruptions. Then you go to Andreas Borg's talks, and he tells you how to kill the whole bug class. However, that is not entirely practical in all cases. However, what I think is possible are architectural changes. So the baseline is you should assume that things that communicate to the outside world will be compromised and minimize damage based on that assumption. So why should the baseband have access to a microphone on your smartphone, or to the camera, or to a GPS receiver? I mean, there's already, or already the, the application CPU that has that. Why, you, why should you give that to both sides? You can route that through the application CPU. And in fact, there are phones who do that, that, that do that. If you have a shared memory architecture, it's somewhat harder, though, because um, Verifying that this shared memory separation is good is, is basically impossible without giving up all the internal documentation. So um, if you have designs where you have a separate modem chipset, you can assume compromise and you can compartmentalize. If you have the shared memory approach, you can do that as well, but you also have to trust the vendor a little bit more. So. That's it. Um, these are the references I wanted to give you if you want to read up more on the architecture. Um, I cannot give you a link to the, to the leaked docs because they have been moving again. Thank you. We have about five more minutes for questions. So if you have questions, just line up. There are mics there, 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 and over there, I think. Yes. Anyone in the room? Internet? No. Nobody has questions? Okay. 
Okay. And thank you. Please, one question. <laughs> we have five more minutes. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Okay, I think he has a question. Oh, he's leaving, I'm not sure. In your, in your research, have you come across any documentation for QCDM or QMI? Um, can you, so, would I have come across attacks for QMI? And yes, for any Qualcomm proprietary protocols that they use uh, for baseband? There, well, there are a lot of um, vulnerabilities described in these, um, in these bulletins. I haven't actually seen code for making use of them. I've written some of that myself, but I cannot share that. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, three, please. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask if you revised your uh, research on the Infineon baseband. Have you tried that again to reevaluate um, it if they actually patched everything? Yes, um, I did. I have, well, after I gave the talk, I gave a talk again at Intel. Um, I used a different vulnerability there. I didn't tell them about this vulnerability. After that, they patched. So, um, I tried again, but I cannot talk about this. Sorry. All right, thanks. Does the internet, internet have a question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Sulu9 is asking if you could elaborate on the real life, real life risk of these attack vectors. How likely it is uh, some bad guy would actually go those routes? Um, the, the real life, um, uh, I, well, it depends on who you are. I, I would say that um, if people, if you're not worth at least one to two million, if the information that can be gained from this attack is not worth at least one, one million to two million dollars, nobody will bother with this kind of attack. However, if you um, are discussing information that is in this ballpark range or above, uh, you might have to worry about them. This is the, basically the market price for ODES. Um, for the uh, new instructions, the new hardware instructions that you see come along once in a while, yes. you said you might, a lot of times you don't know what they do until you see documentation for them, but yeah. presumably they're taking the place of real code that has now disappeared, yes. right? So you can yes. compare. That's correct. So, I mean, still, um, if I see, I, well, I see the, for instance, the K0 lock in a privileged mode um, piece of code, still I don't know what this does. Same for set, uh, for the set I mask. It writes some value. I don't know what it does. Do you see this in the same code? Do they actually have capability registers where they'll use the hardware instruction if the, the revision idea of the chip is a certain level? No, no, no. You, you see this in code, actually. At, at least for case zero lock and, uh, and for I mask, I've seen that in code. You'll see both the software version and the hardware, the new hardware instruction, or you have to go to previous versions of the baseband for the software? No, 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 in, 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 okay. in, current, in current revisions. Okay, anyone else? Internet? No, okay, then please give him another round, round of applause. Thank you.